a joint meeting of City Council and Finance Advisory Committee September 28th and ask for a roll call, please. Jacobson? Finucane? Here. Marquardt? Here. Snow? Here. Noriko? Here. Baker? O'Leary? Ray? Here. Mike Petal? Here. Uh, Golden? Here. Tarzinski? Here. Conlin? Verbick? Here. Neely? Here. Gerhardt? Um, ten present. Okay. We do have um, quorums present to convene the two bodies at this point. Um, and this evening, as you'll recall, we're continuing the discussion on the uh, water rate topic that began at our last uh, joint meeting two weeks ago. I'll turn to Director Haley for some introduction of the topic. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to kind of briefly summarize what's been talked about uh, over the last three meetings and then give you plenty of opportunity for discussion. Um, so first of all, the history of this um, water study started with the uh, fiscal year 2015 budget process where council had requested a comprehensive water systems master plan update and water rate study be conducted to evaluate the current and future demands and capital needs of the city's water system. Uh, the 2013 EPI study also has recommended that the city do a detailed cost of service and rate study. They recommend doing this every three to five years. Um, so staff moved forward and uh, executed a request for proposal. Through that request for proposal process, Burns and McDonald was the firm that was selected um, and approved by council on July 28th of 2014. Burns and McDonald had done an extensive study of um, our water infrastructure. They worked closely with Brian over several months. They came up with a 10-year capital improvement program, which was created, and this corresponding rate structure uh, that has been recommended um, to implement this long-term plan is what is being presented. Um, some other additional background, some of the um, items that came out of these joint meetings. So there's been three joint meetings. Um, there's been several discussion and lots of um, questions. Some of the questions that have been asked and answered is, what would the overall increase over the study period by scenario be, which has been provided and I think vetted last time um, as exhibit A and B? Uh, what is the likely rate impact over time of scenario one, which has also been uh, provided to you in Exhibit A and B. Um, there was an alternate <coughs> rate design provided, which is Scenario 1A. That scenario um, shows greater increases in the service charges, um, where Scenario 1 had greater increases in the usage charges. Um, that's also provided in, in Exhibit A, the memo dated May 18th. There was questions about what would happen to our fund balance if the water rate increased by 3% for four years and did not did the needed projects at a million dollars per year with no debt issued. Um, and I'll get back to debt issued in a minute. So there's a capital improvement plan that Burns and McDonald provided that shows that scenario could not support their recommended 10-year capital improvement program. Um, it does not hold up to the city's fund balance policy and we don't keep our 25% operating costs in line with the million dollar capital balance that we, we have in our policy. I think the scenarios that Burns and McDonald have provided, which are scenario one, one A and two, are uh, proactive to keeping in sync with the 10 year capital improvement plan that they are recommending. Um, I want to just talk quickly about the water fund. So financial impact, <clears throat> the water fund is an enterprise fund um, generally accepted accounting principles require state and local governments to use the enterprise fund type to account for business type activities. These activities are similar to those found in the private sector. Um, business type activities include services primarily funded through user charges, which would be our water rate charges. So in short, um, the water fund is a standalone fund and should be self-sufficient relying on the user charges to maintain the operation and capital needs of the city's water department. 
so again, the recommendations there are three. Staff has um, agreed with Burns and McDonald's recommendation of scenario one, but there's also a scenario 1A and a scenario two. All three, I think, are proactive approaches to funding our 10-year capital plan. Um, all three keep us in the line with our fund balance policy. Um, as the, all three also recommend um, partaking in the state revolving uh, fund loan program. This uh, state revolving fund program is administered by the Illinois Environment Protection Agency. Um, it is a very low interest loan program. Current rate that we uh, noticed last week was about 1.85%. So it's dropped since I've written this memo. Um, there's also been a recent announcement from the governor's office. Uh, they have initiated a clear water initiative, which is great for this loan program. It allows the state to provide um, more funds to, um, to municipalities to keep up with their infrastructure improvements for water and sewer. For us, it would be the water side. Um, so we have more opportunity to um, utilize those funds. Finally, in closing, um, staff is looking for a recommendation to move forward with um, bringing this agenda item to the City Council. Um, we're trying to initiate any rate change in conjunction with what we're doing with the current IGA with the Sanitary District. So if you're, you recall, we opened that IGA back in June. We're currently discussing how we um, collect money from the Sanitary District for doing their invoicing. Um, we're talking about changing the billing cycle uh, to every other month in, ever, instead of every three months. Um, so all three of those items we'd like to sync um, with a January 1st start date. So the three options that we have put in this are um, recommending scenario one, which is the usage increase of 4.5% for five years and then back to the CPI along with the increase to the flat rate. Um, Otherwise, scenario 1A and scenario 2 that Burns and McDonald recommended, um, or otherwise discussion for a different recommendation. So. Okay. Kathy, thank you for that background. And I'd like to set um, before us this evening the goal for City Council to participate with Finance Advisory Committee, um, asking the Finance Advisory Committee to come to consensus or a recommendation that it wishes to put before City Council that we can then consider at a, a future meeting for further action in ordinance form. Um, the, what I'd like to entertain this evening is primary discussion from Finance Advisory Commission. I'm not going to close out questions or discussion from City Council, but mainly Chair Petal, we're looking for your committee to develop a consensus around a recommendation that can be offered to City Council this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, in informal discussions individually with, uh, with members, I think there is a consensus that you need to do something. We need to, we need to pass something. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's more of a consensus on that, I think, that we've got to get something done uh, than um, necessarily uh, between the various options. Um, I think there's more consensus, but I'll let the, the committee talk about this, on uh, number one. Uh, I, I personally f favor 1A, and I'll, I'll talk uh, a bit about that. But before going into that, uh, I've been contacted by a number of citizens who um, <clears throat> required some explanation of, of what's going on here because of um, the way that the numbers are structured in, in the presentations. In the comparative presentations, we showed DeKalb's water rate at $30 monthly. That $30 is based upon the average user who uses eight units of water per month. That is not what any citizen might see as their water bill. That would be a $90 water bill 
uh, which for a low user would be something that was considerably more than, than they would be paying right now. So I want to make it clear once again that when you look at the comparisons and when you look at each of the scenarios, down at the bottom it talks mm -hmm. about an average user and in the <laughs> charts it talks about an average user. That's assuming eight units of water consumed per month, mm -hmm. okay? Now, let me transition and then let other committee members speak. Um, the staff has recommended number one. Uh, I am a very, very low user of water. I use less than one-sixth of the average consumption, mm -hmm. okay? For a user like me, it is important that, from my perspective, I contribute to the overall water infrastructure. Because regardless of how much water is going through the pipe to my home, that pipe has to be there. Whether I use one unit a month or I use 20 units a month, that same pipe has to be there and service my home. So I'm a strong believer that a portion of the increase should be in the flat rate because the infrastructure has to be there regardless of use. And 1A, I think you get the, the best of both worlds. You have a small increase in the monthly flat rate, well, it would be the quarterly flat rate. I believe it goes from $15 to $20 in scenario 1A as proposed for the smallest diameter pipe. So that would be an increase of $1.67 per, per month. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a, a, there still is an increase in the per unit usage. So I think you get a better outcome with respect to distributing the costs of the water infrastructure with 1A, but if you passed one or two, I would be very happy because we need to move forward on this. And so I'll let other members of the committee comment as appropriate. A couple thoughts um, as we get into this um, on the specific rate increases. I'm, um, I want to get a, a couple items in, into the recommendation. I think one is the rate structure, and, and the other one was a, a fairly lengthy discussion about policy control and how we manage the capital portion of the dollar so that they are truly retained for the capital plan in the long run. I think we talked about that at some length in our last session, and I would hope that would be one of the recommendations we would make in addition to the rate structure that we might come to consensus on. Uh, so I'd like to just add that that get to be part of our recommendation, if we might, Chair Petal. Um, the second thing, I made a comment last time, and I, I did a little bit of homework. Um, the city has debt structure policies, and, and I know we're talking about this in terms potentially of a revenue bond structure versus a general obligation bond structure. Um, and therefore, it may not apply uh, specifically because that may be outside the, the debt policy rules, if you will, and would not necessarily be counted against the general obligation debt, and therefore wouldn't go necessarily against our policy limits as there'd be dedicated revenue source here to keep it outside of our overall debt structure. But I just wanted to take a minute to remind us all about our debt policy and where we stand and a couple of highlights that were presented in the June uh, debt ratio analysis that was done for the City Council by William Blair. Uh, they, they do this review on an uh, occasional basis. I think every time that you look at restructuring debt, which you did back at that time, um, one of the items on there is our, our direct debt to full value ratio, uh, which at that time was at 2.55. Our policy says 2. Uh, so we're a little bit over there. Uh, our overlapping debt 
which is a concern that was mentioned with the school district and other bodies that bond and, and go into debt, uh, which has an impact on all of uh, the communities and all of the taxpayers. And I think that's why that's a, a, a meaningful item. Um, the debt burden overlapping in direct debt to full value is at 9.74%. Uh, the Moody's median for AA2 cities was at 44 So that's significantly uh, higher than where they're at. And of course, our general fund balance at that time was reported at 15. I think it's closer to 19 or something for year end, maybe 20, 19 to 20. But the median of all cities in that A2 class, which is where we're rated, is at 44% uh, that they maintain in their fund, uh, general fund balances. So um, that's why I made the comments I made last time and not favoring going into debt. If you look at the capital plan, there's no single compelling element. It's not like building a police station for $12 million. You can't do it brick by brick, so you bond it and you do it. This, most of the project seems to be single, independent uh, maintenance actions between you know, painting one water tower and doing one mile of streets and doing the next mile of streets, something that's more manageable. So uh, given that, 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 where we are with debt, where the community is with debt, with the county going out for 35 million more in debt for the jail. Um, I just remain concerned about debt structure overall and know we're up against our limits depending on who's measuring it exactly. So I, I, I would be against debt uh, and I would personally lean towards uh, scenario two with a 4% increase as long as we maintain the controls necessary to carve out, and in my mind, simply carve out two and a half percent keep it in a separate account. If we're gonna go with four, four and a half percent, then we'd, you know, we'd carve out 3%, say, and put that separately in an account for water capital and use it for the plan as outlined, and then manage it from that. Sorry. I'm sorry, I said I was gonna talk about the revolving loan program, and I did not. I want to make sure this is one, it's uh, at 1.85 percent currently, which is almost cheaper than the cost of inflation. So it would allow us to do some projects, you know, a little quicker uh, at a cheaper cost than it would normally. This does not go towards our general obligation debt. It does not affect our general fund fund balance. It does not affect our bond rating. It does not affect our debt ratios in any shape. So, and. Just as a side note, our general fund balance is coming up almost over 20% at the end of fiscal 15 our auditors are in right now. So that's a great sign. But this loan does, has no bearing on those um, that data that Elizabeth Hennessy had presented earlier. So, Thank you. And to, to be clear that, um, and I, I don't want to split hairs, but it's, it's important to use terminology that, that I think we can understand. The, revol the use of a revolving fund does involve us owing somebody money. So in, in that sense, it's debt. But if I'm not mistaken, there are no bonds. It's, it's a revolving loan fund, so we are not, um, we're not issuing any bonds. Um, that's just a, a factual piece of information. I'm not trying to right. and there's make a, a judgment one way or the other. There's a, a very strict monthly reconciliation that the state would require us to do to show what capital projects, you know, we, it's almost a reimbursement type process. We have to show what exactly we've done based on what we applied for, for that money to do to make sure that's exactly what we're tracking, which is also a great audit trail. So as to not run out of time, let's uh, move on to other members of the committee. Officer Dave, yeah. Well, thank you. As far as like getting in, uh, I, I guess I kind of echo uh, Tom's thoughts on this. Uh, looks like uh, we could do a pay-as-you-go system, and uh, even though the rates are very low, and you know, I'm, I'm in banking, we've been looking at low rates for a long time. I don't know that we need to add the 1.8 percent cost if the with the projects, but they need to be done. It's repairs, replacements, maintenance, ongoing, normal sort of a thing. I would hope that sometime we get to address an expansion project that might then need, you know, a, a big surge of activity and maybe a, a bonded or, or credit 
funded project there. Um, I, I like the controls that uh, Tom Terzinski mentioned, and I think with that, uh, I, I just probably stay shy of using debt since it doesn't look like we really need to uh, for these projects. Okay. Uh, Lynn. <laughs> Dave, thank you. Dave, are, when you say avoiding debt, are you including both the revolving type of debt and the bond obligations, both? Yes. Okay. I'm still listening to what people with more experience and, and wisdom in this area have to say. So I'm, I'm not dead set on any one alternative as far as these options. I, I would prefer to listen to you. That's fine. And, and I think um, in, in terms of the discussion, we can separate out uh, at, least, at least two issues and we can make separate recommendations with respect to, to those issues. And however the committee wishes to proceed, um, we'll, we'll go in that direction. But it seems to me that um, We'll try to come to consensus, or at least uh, a majority, a plurality, on which of the options we prefer. And then if we wanted to, to, to talk about our recommendation with respect to the actual financing tools that, that are used, we can do that as well, as well as um, the, the control, policy, the, yeah. Yeah, the, the policy. So, uh, Mike? Yeah, I really echo what's been said. Uh, well done. Uh, just again, a concern, is it three years that we have on the uh, loan option? How long do we have to decide on the 1.85? Do you know? Yeah, it, I believe it's an annual application process. Okay. So no time limit. But uh, the rates, it, is, it adjusts, I think, annually as well. So. Yeah, so I'll echo on the, the, the no debt and pay as we go. I still have concerns about our, our future commitments and what we'll be asking our citizens to pay with regard to streets and, and those. And I understand, Chair Petal, you separating this out as not being taxed, as I understand what you're, where you're coming from. But Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not separating it out as to not being taxes. Right. What, what I'm separating out is the, the fact is no matter what we do, there are going to be user charges that are um, utilized for the purpose of financing some kind of water system program. Uh, the three alternatives that we have before us use uh, some variation of the percentage increase in the timing of the increase in the per unit rate for water and in the case of 1A, uh, the per unit rate for water and the, the flat charge for, for having a node on, on the water system. Um, I'm not making any judgment beyond that, I'm just saying that once you decide which option you want, um, you can choose as to whether you want to bond that, whether you want to use the revolving fund, or whether you want to uh, simply go uh, pay, pay as you go. Um, and there are implications for, for all of those options, but I'm not making any statement okay. about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I would echo again uh, scenario two uh, pay as we go type formula uh, because again we have these looming decisions on uh, or council has looming decisions on <coughs> other increases to the community. Okay. Connie? I'm going to be the uh, the one who's going to be different. Um, I have thought all along that the number one was the best option. Um, I'm one who uses a lot of water for whatever reason. I don't know why. They actually put a new meter in my house thinking something was wrong with it. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, if you use the water, you should pay for it. 
Um, and it, we, in, in one, we are increasing the, the fixed fee a little bit, but we're also increasing the usage fee. Um, it sounds like that um, the debt um, rate and the way we can receive the money isn't a bad plan for this water system. Bonding, you know, you said this, you know, this isn't a bond. This is somewhat like a line of credit type of thing. I don't, I don't think that that's a bad thing. So I, I guess I'm going to vote for number one because 1A hits an individual who doesn't use a lot of water and all of a sudden their bill, it sounds like their bill is going to increase quite a bit and they're going to think, well, I'm trying to be conservative, but all of a sudden my bill went way up. I, that's so, I, I guess I would, I would vote for one, I would vote for 1A if, if everybody else wanted to do 1A. I, I think we have to have some sort of debt so we cannot, you know, in, in five to six, seven years, come up with a whole lot of problems that we have to fix. And that, then we'll have to go possibly and, um, you know, the citizens will have to be more involved in, in paying for it or, or we'll have to bond or something. It sounds like that we've got a fairly decent plan from Burns and McDonald. Um, and, you know, their recommendation was one, and I, and I think the, um, the staff recommended one, and I would go along with one. Just, just to clarify. Um, Am I? Just, just, no, you're, you're perfectly clear. Um, the maximum increase of 1A over 1 for a small user, the maximum increase would be $3.33 per quarter. So I don't think that that's the maximum increase. It would be $3.33 per quarter because <clears throat> one has a, uh, a three month flat rate of sixteen sixty seven. One A has twenty dollars as the rate. That's for three months. And so given that given that one A has a lower increase in the per unit rate, okay, they would get some relief even from the per unit rate with the with the small amount. So yes, we are talking about we're still talking about fourteen or fifteen dollars a year. But it's not a hundred dollars. You know, it's yeah. not a hundred. Well, three dollars is significant to a lot of people. I, I don't want to minimize the the fact that um, that there will be an increase, and nobody likes there to be an increase in any bill that they pay. Um, but it it would be three dollars and thirty three cents per quarter, which compared to one. Compared to what one, one would be, that's the most it would be. It would probably be a few cents less than that, but not yeah. enough to not enough to talk about. Well, then I would go between one and one A. Okay. Um, okay. At at this particular point, I'd like to take a straw poll. Uh, I can do that. Sure. Correct. Okay. I'd like to take a straw poll as to which members of the committee as their first choice would choose option two. Can you please state their names? When Mike Verbeck. Oh. Dave Conlon. Dave Conlon. Tom, you were in support of two, or are you? Yeah, I can, I can support two. OK. How many can support 1A? It, it's not a matter. All right, that, that's should okay. I, should Most, I do one? It doesn't make it. Okay. <laughs> all right. What about option one? Well, I would support that too. Can I? Yeah. I mean, you can vote more than once. Yeah, I you would support, support one too. Oh, do you need these names? Or you give up? I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> oh, okay. so do one A again? All right. Again? So one A was Petal, uh, Golden, and Neely, and then uh, the. Um, what, what we're trying to do is, I can't, uh, so let's, let's rephrase the question and make sure that, we, that we're answering the question, okay? How many people could live with option two? 
Raise your hands. Yeah. All right. So we've got uh, Conlon, Terezinski, and Verbeek who can live with two. How many could live with 1A? Okay. So Neely, Golden, Petal. How many could live with one? Okay. Did she get her name? Yes, thank yeah. you. So, Mr. Mayor, if I can, just for purposes of the record here, we have on the agenda discussion of the water rate item, and I think uh, Chair Petal very eloquently indicated that it, we're just having a straw poll here to kind of determine the consensus mm -hmm. of the of the Finance Advisory Committee. Um, I wanted to reiterate that for the record so there's no question for Open Meetings Act purposes whether we're taking action on this tonight. Okay. Thank you, Dean. Um, so it, it, it appears that the Finance Advisory Committee is um, a bit split. Um, and there, there seems to be, uh, by, by a small margin, um, there is a majority of support with living with option A. Um, option A is the only option that got at least four members. No, no, that's one. One, I meant one. I meant one, I'm sorry. Okay. My, I misspoke, I misspoke. A. No, no, I'm I quite, I, as I said, I'm quite happy with, with any, any of the options. Um, so, you know, by a slight majority, there is, there is support for all of the three options. Four members of the committee said they could live with option one, okay? But I don't think there's strong guidance from, from the committee as to which option you should choose. Now, with respect to, uh, let, let me ask uh, another series of straw poll questions. First of all, how many members could live with the use of, gen or I'm sorry, live with revenue bond debt funded out of the water fund? So how many would be able to live with the issuance of debt for the purpose of financing bonded debt, or you're bonded, not talking the, about this revolving the actual, fund the issuance okay. of debt. Okay. So right. I'm talking about bonded debt. Okay. okay. Oh, hold on. I have a question. I'm yes. sorry. This isn't bonded debt. No, it's not. No. Revolving fund. There's is not no, no scenario debt. is recommending bonded okay. debt. Okay. This is something different that you're bringing up. Uh, that I am making sure that, that the city council has a consensus on whether there whether we favor going out to issue a bond. Okay, so there's two things, bond and then revolving, revolving fund credit. and then the, the third option is to just just pay as you go out of the revenues. Okay. Um, I just and there are some scenarios. So okay. all right. How many would uh, be not a, well. I want. I want to. I want to make this. How many would be supportive of issuing debt if that was the choice made? Which kind? Yeah. Which no. kind? Which kind? Bonded or well, revolving? When you when you say issuing debt, I mean bonds. Okay. 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 So, how many would be in favor of issuing bonds? Okay. How many would be in favor of using the revolving fund? Or could live with it. Or could live, all right, fine. Could live with using the revolving fund. And I would like to add that given what Director Haley said, that's something that could offer the option, if perhaps if the first year it weren't necessary, but if for some reason it looked as if it would be necessary in year two or year three, that it wouldn't be, uh, it would be open. It would be a possibility. Yes. Right. All right. right. Three. Okay. And how many would live with strictly pay as you go? I can Oh, strictly? Or could live with it? 
can live with it. I can live with it. Okay. You know, I, I think that there is an, an argument for using the revolving fund. It's a cash management argument. Uh, but there seems to be a consensus among the committee that they would prefer pay as you go. Um, that would mean designing the water revenues to flow in such a way that you were able to, to use them on an ongoing basis that way. Chair Pestle, if, if economics were, were seen to justify the revolving fund rate, would there be opposition to taking a proactive stance in using that revolving fund as a source of capital? You know, I, I think that uh, I'll let members of the, the committee speak for themselves. Um, in, in my opinion, and only speaking for me, you can use the, you can use the revolving fund as a line of credit to improve the cash flow and smooth out uh, the ups and downs of the, of the availability of revenue. At 1.8, 1 1.9, 2%, uh, I think that's, that's a good use of, of funds, um, and I don't think it puts the city at, uh, at too much risk. And if, if I were managing, um, uh, a business or a government that had that opportunity to smooth things out at that particular rate, I would probably use the revolving fund. I wouldn't use it to, per, to uh, achieve additional capital, but I would use it to smooth out the vagaries in revenue so that you have the money available at the time that, that you need it. So I wouldn't use it as a means of borrowing for anything but cash flow. Sure. Other members? Yeah. I have a question. If we do not bond and if we do not use the revolving credit and we use available funds, if in the future we need the money, where will it come from? Within the next 10 years. So the Burns and McDonald study takes into account using that revolving fund loan at certain points, exactly like how Chair Petal had said, when our fund balance dips too low, that's when it'll say, okay, let's take out that revolving credit to keep this, these 10 years of projects going. Um, and that's already built into all three of these scenarios in the rates, in the increases. So they've already factored in paying those back within these rate increases. So, you know, a pay-as-you-go, we would be instilling this recommended rate increase, and if we don't need to take that out, we could certainly monitor that fund balance. But if for some reason we start to dip below our reserves, we either have to, two, one, not do some of the infrastructure improvements that have been planned, or possibly come back and say at that time, see where rates are at and apply for them. Other members? And we, yes, there was one more item, right? Are we coming back to policy? That's, oh yes, yes. I was I, I'm ask sorry. If we uh, are moving. Do, do do you want to phrase that, Tom? Yeah, I, um, I, uh, using scenario one at four and a half percent, right? And we're uh, the model and, and the schedules that are presented to us in the uh, water rate study uh, pretty much are consistent using one and a half percent as a base. That is the CPI rate that we had been using um, all along to have an annual increase. So uh, assuming that that is the case uh, through this five-year period, uh, my recommendation or thought would be uh, taking 1.5% away from 45 leaves you 3. So I, I would suggest that we take 3% each of those years uh, of the gross water rate receipts and put that in a separate capital fund and have that compound and then manage the capital uh, along with the current, I mean, according to the schedule, the beginning balance is going to be $2 million on uh, page 2-10. 
and you're going to transfer from operations this year 920,000, and then every year going forward with the new rate increase, you would increment that by the uh, three percent number, which is roughly 150 grand a year, and that'd be 300 the second year, 450 the third year, and it would remain that way through that life cycle. And that way, none of it would drift back into operations, which I think is one of the concerns is that all of a sudden it gets eaten up with operations and we haven't achieved our capital uh, plan. So this would segregate it and, and hopefully give the council good control. And, and I think that it, it should be noted that the approach that Tom's suggesting is a conservative approach. Um, it, it does assure that of the increase, assuming that you know that the 1.5 percent is a is a good assumption, which we have to, uh, for purposes of planning. Um, all that you're putting aside is the rate increase, the portion of the the rate increase, and that presumes that none of the current rate was being held for um, for capital capital projects. So I think this is. This is pretty conservative, and I can, I can definitely support um, that idea because it, it at least protects the rate increase and sends a message to our citizens that we're serious about uh, using these funds for the purpose of maintenance and improvement of, of the water system. So I would support that. Okay. Are you going to ask for a straw poll on yes. whether? Okay. Uh, Yes, Connie, please. I'm going to be controversial again here. Um, that increase was part of the whole plan as well as the additional debt. So if we take 3% out, we're still not going to be able to do what you want to do with the water system if we have no debt. Am I thinking right here? Well, it, it's, it seems to me that there, there was not significant opposition expressed when we discussed the issue of the revolving fund not being used to borrow money to be used for capital improvements, but rather to smooth out the, the cash flow, that it that it's, would be used as a line of credit and so uh, I think that the, um, the advice to utilize the line of credit or use the revolving fund as appropriate um, did seem to, to pass muster. So uh, with, with the guidance that it wasn't a means of increasing the amount that we would be spending. We would still be doing pay as you go with a, a small amount going to interest costs to smooth out um, any revenue dips and, and increases. And we don't know those at, at this particular point in time, but it gives us a mechanism to smooth those things out without uh, committing to something that isn't a pay-as-you-go method. Does that make sense? So the suggestion is to have the money that normally comes from the water fund not to go into the general fund. Not well, it doesn't go into the general fund anyway. What, what um, Mr. Tarasinski is saying, and, and I do agree with this, is let's make sure that the money that we are uh, committing to our citizens through this process to go for maintenance and improvements of the water system that it doesn't get eaten up by being shifted over to operations well, that's rather what I, than capital. Mm, that's what I was saying, right. Okay, so um, so it, it would not go into the operating budget of the, the water fund. But the operating budget of any, any um, fund changes, you know, on an annual basis, so. Yes, that's correct, but you, you would need to revisit that that item and make you would need to make explicit judgments um, as to what you wanted to do. But the the idea is to segregate it so that um, so that.
so that there has to be an affirmative decision mm -hmm. that you are going to exactly. change the placement of that. Doesn't say, you know, we can't yeah. bind the city council to not use that money in a different way, but they have to come before the public and they would have to, you know, explicitly make, make that decision that they were going to move that money out of capital and into, into operations. But clearly the intent and uh, what Tom's suggesting is this is at least analogous to the policy. The policy would be that the rate increase is for capital. Uh, now, if there's some, th some kind of emergency that you have to fund uh, operations, then there's a decision as to where you get that money from. And it may come from capital funds, it may come from the general fund, it may come from a different water increase. Yeah, Kathy, I'm sorry. I just want to reiterate one thing, and that is the 10-year capital improvement plan. I think that is the key to this whole um, water rate study, is that they put together not only operating, but also a capital 10-year plan that is a guide for us to follow so that we do do all those capital projects, so that we know what is out there and when they need to be replaced or being recommended to be replaced, so it keeps us on target. They have incorporated operation. I mean, we have one fund. It's operations and capital. We analyze the fund balance quarterly and report that to the council. So we will obviously continue to do that. But it's the 10-year capital improvement plan that is the guide uh, for the for the city. I think that's important to note. Just one other point, and uh, thank you. I, I agree that's the objective is to have that money. And in their report, again, going to their beginning balance, they start with $2 million in the capital, unrestricted capital fund. They call it water capital fund in their report. Uh, they start with uh, unrestricted balance of $2 million, and they add 900000 in 15, which is the current year, which would assume that you're generating 900000 in operating revenues over and above operating costs that could be funded in the capital. So they're starting with a, a $2.9 million unrestricted capital fund. Uh, it would be my expectation that that would be transferred into this fund as well as then the go forward. So that would give you the kind of fund balances that you mm -hmm. are expecting to, to provide to the capital, to the capital list. Correct. I think right. that's the whole point of them doing the fund balance report here. It also shows when they think they may need to partake into that revolving loan program right. as well, um, and where they've never dipped below the one million throughout the right. whole 10-year process. Right. Okay. okay, all things considered, um, straw poll, uh, how many people would support the idea of segregating the funds uh, into capital fund uh, based on the suggestion made by Mr. Terezinski. How many would support that? I, I believe five. Okay. Director Haley, does that give you uh, consensus from finance advisory that gives you a direction to move forward with um, ordinance draft that would be coming back to council in a first reading and then a second reading? Uh, I think so, yep. Okay. Um, I'd like to note there, there are two other issues that will be addressed in that ordinance. Um, one of those being the intergovernmental agreement with the sanitary district regarding payment of that um, obligation to the sanitary district. And then secondly would be the billing cycle? Correct. So we're looking at, in that agreement to change the way um, we do the billing for the sanitary district, and currently that fee is built into our water rate. We want to make it more transparent so it shows the sanitary district is paying us for that service um, outright. Um, and we're working on negotiating uh, terms with them right now. Um, we opened that in June. We have six months to kind of come up with a conclusion and bring it to council. And then we want to switch the three-month billing cycle to every two months. So everyone would get a bill every two months. Um, 
and I think that'll help. That'll have the bills will be smaller. It'll be easier, I think, to remember. You know, if you get it on an even month or an odd month, and okay. And did I see you indicating affirmatively that you're comfortable having heard discussion this evening? Uh, are you comfortable? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, discussion from Council Alderman Snow. Um, I just thought, comment. You know, the water fund is an essential service that that city now provides. It's like any utility, uh, either natural gas or electricity. I think no citizen wants to suddenly turn on the faucet or turn on a light switch and not have something there coming out. So, so I do think it's important that we fund the infrastructure of the water department. Um, and and you know, most of the water fund is, is infrastructure. The water itself is free. It's coming out of the ground. You know, we don't really pay for the water. You pay for the infrastructure. And so that's why the big debate, I think, is to how to divide that infrastructure cost out, out to our res residents. Um, you know, as far as the different uh, funding mechanisms, I, I do think the revolving fund would provide some level of flexibility. I mean, if you have an extra two, three thousand dollars in your account, but you don't—that's not enough to do a project because most of these uh, water main replacements are pretty expensive, and so it would probably help even out the the annual construction of of the uh, of the water mains. I mean, we have water mains that you know. The city is 150 years old, and I guess we have water mains that are 100 years old or out there in that neighborhood. So this is a long-term project. Um, it's an essential service that we have to fund. Um, and I think hearing the discussion, either 1 or 1A, one you know, seems to be my preference, too, is, is one of those two. So, um, yeah, I think good discussion. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Alderman Narenko? Utilizing the revolving fund to even out the revenue stream makes sense to me, um, particularly since I heard um, a news report today that illustrates a situation that is not likely to occur here, but it nevertheless is um, an example of the, the vagaries of uh, revenue. Um, city in California uh, succeeded beyond its wildest expectations in terms of conservation measures. I mean, the state had mandated, you know, a 40% drop or something like that, and they were 60 plus, you know, down. So of course their revenue was down by like $900,000. Well, you know, clearly we aren't gonna get in that situation, but it, it, it does demonstrate that, um, you know, uh, either because we have a rainy summer and people aren't watering their tomatoes as much, or, um, you know, in 10 years from now, conservation has become more of an issue here. I mean, we may need to take a look at, um, you know, revenue issues. So bottom line is, you know, utilizing that low interest rate program makes sense to Thank me. Thank you. Um, let me turn to public participation at this point. Does anyone in the gallery wish to address the issue before council in the committee of the whole? Okay, is there further discussion from council or finance advisory committee? Hearing none, then Director Haley will uh, anticipate coming back with an ordinance draft um, in a, a first and a second reading cycle, then before council on the water rate study and the related matters. Okay. Um, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn them, the committee of the hall. So moved. It's been Second. moved. Second. I'm sorry. Second. Uh, moved by Alderman Nareko, seconded by um, um, committee member Neely. <laughs> All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, mm -hmm. same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. We will reconvene at the 6 o'clock hour for the regular meeting. Yes.
Council, September 28th, and ask for a roll call. Jacobson? Present. Finucane? Here. Marquardt? Here. Snow? Here. Noriko? Here. Baker? Present. O'Leary? Ray? Present. Seven present. Thank you. Um, I would like to note for the record uh, this evening, um, late afternoon, just before the uh, committee of the whole meeting, I received communication from Alderman O'Leary. Um, I'd like to read that communication at this point. Mayor Ray, I am resigning my office of Alderman of the Seventh Ward and will give you my official letter on Friday. So with that, um, the expressed intent from Alderman O'Leary is to resign her position, uh, and it sounds, sounds to me like effective Friday. So we'll anticipate that communication. Um, let me turn to Sadie uh, to lead us in a Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sadie, I apologize for my informality. Help me with your last name. Chris Haven. Chris Haven? Thank you. No <laughs> um, we have before us the... Uh, Published agenda, I am intending this evening to remove items F3 and F4 from consent agenda, but uh, the content of uh, the published agenda would remain the same. Um, are there any additions or deletions to that agenda? Hearing none, I'll ask for approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. It's, Second. I'm sorry. Moved by? Dave. Alderman Jacobson, seconded by Alderman Finucan. Um, roll call. Jacobson? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Baker? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Um, I would like to begin this meeting with a uh, statement regarding public participation protocol. I wish to address a topic that's been on my mind since the public participation at the September 14, 2015 meeting of City Council. In that meeting, during public discussion, a citizen approached an alderman from the rear of the dais, passing a note and making comment privately. I fully realize a topic such as University Village, which was on our agenda at that September 14th meeting, raises emotions, but does not warrant disrespect nor irreverence to the decorum and the reasonable discussion atmosphere within the framework and protocol of the City Council meeting. Safety, security, and respect of council members, staff, and guests are paramount in these procedures. I do not want to subject council nor staff to <coughs> vulnerability, anxiety, nor nervousness, risk, or compromise of their safety. Comments from the floor of city council are to be public in nature and made from the podium with the use of the microphone for broadcast and recording purposes. No one from the gallery audience is to approach the dais from the rear. Anyone wishing to deliver materials to council members at the dais is asked to present them to the city clerk or ask permission of the chair to deliver the same from the front of the dais. No one is invited to the rear of the dais for personal dialogue with council members. Sergeant at Arms Police Chief Gene Lowry is asked to monitor public participation during the council meeting and keep order within these procedures. Behavior or actions by any member of the public outside this protocol will be ruled out of order by the chair and the person will be escorted from council chambers for the remainder of the meeting. Our viewing audience at home and the recording of the meeting 
can only effectively pick up sound from speakers when they are talking into a microphone. The ambient sound from, uh, from the room does not get picked up clearly for these purposes. Thus, speakers are asked to move to the podium with invitation from the chair of the meeting and only approach the front of the dais upon invitation from the chair of the meeting. I will monitor this protocol of audience participation in council meetings and plan to rule out of order behaviors beyond its defined bounds. Um, and I, I would have to note that by and large, uh, public participation has been within bounds of this protocol. I just wanted for the record to uh, note that we will be uh, administering that protocol. Moving to special items, we have proudly DeKalb as our first item. Um, we have a grant award from the Department of Justice for the purchase of specialized police equipment. I'll turn to Chief Lowry to present this topic. Good evening, City Council, staff, and our community. Uh, I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to discuss a, a, a small grant that the City of uh, DeKalb Police Department obtained and read you just a brief narrative in regard to it and tell you just a couple details. The Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program was created as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2005. This merged the discretionary Edward Byrne Memorial Grant Fund with the formula-based local law enforcement block grant program. The Justice Assistant Grant program administered by the Bureau of Justice Assistance is the leading source of federal justice funding to state and local jurisdictions. This program provides local governments with critical funding necessary to support a wide range of programming and in this situation law enforcement and technology improvement. The Bureau of Justice Statistics calculates for each state and territory a minimum base allocation which will be based on a congressionally mandated Justice Assistance Grant formula, and it can be enhanced by the state share of the national population and by the state share of the country's part one violent crime statistics. In this situation, Council, we've received a $15,427 $15, grant. It's a no match grant for the city, so it is, it's totally uh, money that's usable without needing any grant, uh, matching grant requirement. In this situation, it will be used to enhance uh, some of our investigative technology needs, uh, which includes a variety of equipment that we've been unable to purchase through our, our normal budget process. And again, there is no local match grant. In uh, previous year, we also had obtained this grant and purchased some, in conjunction with the Sheriff's Office, some specialized equipment for the Special Operations Team. Uh, again, it's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice addition to a, you know, a tight budget and will help us to do many things uh, that we were unable to do. And in closing, I'd like to say this, I don't know, and this really isn't on the agenda, but I'm gonna take the opportunity anyway, with respect to you, Your Honor, and Council. If you've watched the media at all, uh, today, over the weekend, police officer Jonathan Jerzyk happened to respond to a theft call. He met with a young lady who was at an, had been at a nail salon getting her nails prepared for her first homecoming dance. Uh, unfortunately, while she was tending to those needs, someone stole her dress. Her parents were unavailable, they were both at work, and she was left out of the loop. Uh, she had to go watch her friends getting their pictures taken, and she sadly sat by. Officer Jerzyk responded to the call, he could have taken a theft report and walked away. Uh, but out of the kindness of his heart, he took the young, young, young lady on a mini shopping spree, I have to add with the permission of her supervisor, or his supervisor, and ended up getting her address for the homecoming event. Not only to get her address, he paid for it out of his pocket with the help of a citizen and a, and a donation from the store uh, by getting, getting the address for a little bit of a discounted rate. But it was so late in the day, he took her out to get her something to eat. And after she was done eating and she was ready to go to homecoming, he drove her there. So I know this doesn't seem like a big thing in the big scale of things in policing and in, in crime and community, 
but I thought it was a testament to the men and women of the DeKalb Police Department as once again you hear a story of this nature where they went above and beyond just to do the right thing. And a little bit of love goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, moving to the second item then, Burger King project presentation by John Kaiser. John? John is Vice President of Development for Cave Enterprises Operations, LLC. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, City Council, it seemed like it was just a few months ago. It was actually May 11th. I just looked in my calendar that I was up here discussing the uh, renovation of the Burger King. And um, Ms. DeVita invited me up here just to take a few minutes of your time to tell you about the project and kind of explain to you how it went. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the historical context of the site, um, not only as far as Burger King goes, but also uh, you know, in more in depth about the uh, Glidden property. So um, I just want to thank you. I, I, I do want to say that working with Ellen and Derek and the team you guys have, it was such a smooth process. Um, it went very well. Everyone was, you know, very engaged in it, and I just want to thank you guys for that. Um, went really well. So, figure out how to use this clicker. Okay. Um, I think, I think what I wanted to just kind of describe briefly was that Burger King uh, that's been there uh, has, was built in 1965, so it's 50 years old. And it's store number 255, so it's the 255th Burger King that was ever um, built in the country. Uh, and at the time, it was kind of a prototype, I guess you'd say it was kind of a cutting edge Burger King. There's some pictures on the screen of some of the 1950s Burger Kings before it really became a franchise per se. It was just a walk up location. Um, John, is the one in the lower middle, is that in Naperville? Chance. No, but it's very similar to that, okay. uh, that, that style where it was just walk up. There wasn't drive throughs yet. Um, 255 was kind of the next generation after that. And I think the picture on the right describes, you know, that, that uh, restaurant that was, you know, down the street in DeKalb. That's what it looked like when, when it was built. In fact, the, uh, the rendering to the left was off of the archival drawing of the original uh, blueprints. So it had these arches that came out the building. And when I was there, when we demoed the building, up in the bar joist, there was these I-beams that were sticking up that were cut off. It didn't make any sense. And I was talking to the contractor, and I realized that they were still kind of remnants of what the store used to look like. So you know, at the time, it was, it was kind of a cutting edge building. Um, so you know, through the 1970s, they kind of toned things down, things got more earth tony, and up on the upper left there is pretty much what the DeKalb Burger King looked like back in the day, back in the 70s. They added the drive through, it was, uh, they cut the tower, they cut the uh, archons off and kind of brought it, brought it back down to earth. Um, <laughs> just, just some promotional material from back then. But uh, you know the, the the 80s and the 90s weren't that kind to the Burger King and DeKalb. It kind of was operated by uh, the operator who was there. Um, eventually went into default with the franchise and went into bankruptcy, and that's when Cave Enterprises uh, bought the bought the restaurant a few years ago, and just kind of showing the before and after of what it used to look like, and. Um, we decided to make kind of a full-blown commitment to the, to the location, and we did the latest prototype that, that Burger King introduced to the system. This was actually the first franchisee Burger King that got this new look on the interior. They call it Garden Grill, and it kind of, it's kind of a retro look, you know, back with natural earth tones and uh, natural materials to kind of reflect the brand heritage. So um, that's what we did there. I think what was most interesting about it, though, was getting to know the Glidden um, historical group. Obviously, their, um, the homestead and the barn is right next door, and there was an easement that was granted for the landscape buffer that we created in the rear of the parking lot. And getting to know those folks 
uh, Rich DeMink and, and Jim Morrell, uh, spending some time over at the, at, the, uh, at the museum, I guess you'd say. I, I found out that, that where the Burger King sits was the original homestead cabin for uh, Joseph Glidden. And you spend some time in that museum and you really realize that the innovation behind the homesteaders that came to DeKalb uh, back in the 1840s, 1850s, when the railroad was first coming through. And, you know, if you want to learn about barbed wire, spend some time over there. <laughs> but it really kind of drove, it drove innovation in the country in a way that you, you wouldn't normally think of. And I, I, just, I just thought it was interesting. I think Ellen kind of found it interesting that um, in terms of the development of DeKalb, the historical significance of the site is, is pretty powerful. Um, there's a Burger King there now. Um, we're glad to be there. The sales are going great. We're glad that we were able to, to reinvest in the property and, uh, and make it right again. But um, I really thought that, you know, in terms of the long history of DeKalb, um, you know, it kind of had a, it's kind of got a special spot that a lot of places, you know, you might not know that if you, if you didn't uh, research it. So I just want to thank you guys. Uh, thank you for, you know, your time and working with us to uh, make that a successful renovation. And, uh, and that's it. Appreciate it. John, thank you for your presentation this evening. Thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you for your investment in DeKalb as well. I appreciate, appreciate it. Thank that. you. Um, Chief Lowry, thank you for your contributions this evening as part of our Proudly DeKalb feature. Thank appreciate you, that. Um, We have a presentation this evening from DeKalb Chamber uh, of Commerce annual report. I'll ask Matt Duffy to give us that presentation. Thank you, Mayor Ray, uh, City Council, City staff, and the public here today. And it was great to come right after the Proudly DeKalb stories because uh, uh, for those of you that haven't seen the, the marketing that's going on in the area, is just to talk about all the great things that are going on. So when Chief Lowry sh shared that story today, that was just you know one of the many things that are going on that are, that are great to make this community what it is. So it's great that it's being you know, reported on here at, at, uh, at the council meetings too to celebrate and not just to you know, talk about the things that maybe are, are, are not on the same, same level there, same positive story. So uh, along those same lines, the, the, the Calp Chamber of Commerce took over the uh, special events that handled a, a number of events that are basically community type events for, for DeKalb and, and these are other things that make you know DeKalb a great place to, to live, work and, and learn as, as has been the kind of the coined phrase. Um, one of the events, the farmer's market is a, goes on throughout the course of June through September, Van Buren Plaza, uh, 10 a.m. to 2 or 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and uh, uh, we've had the live lunch series, we've got the EBT, we've got the, uh, uh, the direct uh, debit and credits. Uh, and we've had uh, we've had full uh, markets for the last uh, last couple of years now. Uh, we've we've fulfilled the space, and the vendors have really been responsive to the uh, to the time and, and uh, some of the changes that have been made to it. So we continue to to gather feedback on that. Um, Spooktacular is another event that's coming up. It's the the kind of the downtown trick or treating event. Uh, allows for crafts and a chance for uh, the kids to to dress up and in, in, uh, and take the streets of uh, downtown in a safe environment and and uh, get some some candy, do some crafts, and have some some fun down there. So with a great uh, partnership with Nestle, we're able to provide the uh, the candy to to those uh, merchants that participate. Uh, um, moving on to holidays, uh, over the holiday season, there's a downtown shopping events as well as Santa coming to town. Uh, we've got a nice. Uh, we get the snow plow and the fire truck and all the people that are uh, bringing it in, and it's fun to the, see the kids' faces to say that Santa's here in DeKalb. You know, he's here, and, and uh, to see them light up with that. And, and the, prior to it at the Egyptian Theater through partnership and the Madrigals, and uh, just makes for a, a fun community event and, and a great experience for, for community members to, to participate in that. Uh, moving on to a new event we added a couple years ago now, it's in the, the, the third year this year already, uh, the 4th Street Family Fun Fest, uh, an opportunity to, to draw some traffic down to the 4th, 4th Street Corridor down there, uh, have a, a touch a truck event, uh, showcasing some of the, the area um, uh, businesses and, and what they have to, to provide and, and uh, just another summer activity for family fun, free events, uh, come out and have a good time and bring the, bring the family. So uh, we're trying to, do, to continue that uh, kind of annual thing that we've created with that. 
Uh, we also have the kind of the breakfast with the bunny, the, the, the Easter type event. Uh, where we uh, have done it, we're at breakfast at the, the Lincoln Inn to, to drive the people to a downtown place and then also uh, the opportunity to, to see the movie Hop at the Egyptian Theater. So again, another nice family event, brings people downtown, gives them a chance to, to check out all that we have to offer. So um, then the Memorial Day Parade, another annual uh, event that takes place here. Uh, it's great to, to celebrate that. We've had some great weather and great turnout the last few years for that event. And uh, the parade is, is taken on uh, each year. I walk in it with my kids' uh, Cub Scout troop, and, and you see it seems like the, the numbers continue to grow, and more and more people are excited about it. So uh, look forward to that. And then concluding at the Elwood House with a nice program to, uh, to, to do what the, uh, the intent of Memorial Day is all about. So um, moving on to uh, we have one additional event that basically we've done. And then this year, instead of one big event, we worked with the, the downtown merchants for a series of shopping events. Um, so we did kind of a, uh, a regular theme. It was, wasn't quite monthly, but it was, uh, I think we did 10 of them in the past year. I shouldn't say I think we did. We definitely did. And uh, an opportunity just to do some shopping type events to build in with the community type events. Good combination of the two. Uh, kind of the lead one of that was the Go Red for Women event. It was a fundraiser for the American Heart Association. It provided some, some downtown uh, booths of vendors out on the streets and a chance to uh, have you know uh, some activity going on not only in the in the stores but also on the sidewalks to, to draw some things so um, we continue to work with the the downtown uh, vendors uh, we helped them with the uh, or the downtown uh, merchants uh, we helped them with a, a new map and um, uh, brochure that's uh, that's given out uh, we've also worked with a, a new website for downtown DeKalb uh, social media channels with Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram and continue to get the word out about all the, the things that are going on in the, in the downtown area. So uh, that's kind of a recap of the, uh, the, the previous year for the agreement. And, uh, you know, we look forward to continue that and providing some great things to be proud of here in DeKalb again for the coming year. So. Great. Thank you, ma'am, for the report and uh, for the activities throughout the year. Any questions from council? Seeing none, we'll, we'll move on. Um, we have several appointments before us this evening, um, the first of which is appointment of Ronald Parch to fill a vacancy on the Finance Advisory Committee through June 30th, 2018. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Finucane. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Noreko. All those in favor of the appointment of Ron Parch to Finance Advisory Committee indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carry. Appointment of Christine Scholl to the Building Board of Appeals for a five-year term from October 15th, October 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Marquardt. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Finucane. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Reappointment of Steve Irving to the Building Board of Appeals for a four-year term from July 1, 2015 <coughs> through June 30th, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Noreko. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Snow. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Reappointment of Chuck Shepard to the Building Board of Appeals for a five-year term from July 1, 2015 through June 30th, 2020. Is so there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Snow. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Marquardt. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. We have um, several um, individuals wishing to speak to council. First, uh, Chuck Shepard. Uh, Chuck Shepard, Shepard Construction. I'm general contractor and building owner in, in uh, DeKalb. Uh, and I guess I'm coming a little late <laughs> to the table. I was gonna encourage you to vote uh, yes on the three appointments that, we, uh, that you had just before you just a moment ago. I come before you, though, also to update you on our activities of our Builder Board of Review. This board is mandated under the International Building Code. This code is what we operate under for all the uh, building work that takes care of. However, our code date is 2003. Yes, 2003. And we are now uh, reviewing the 2015. 
Normally there's code dates every three year, the international code comes out with a new book and there will be just a few, generally just a few changes. And, and what has occurred is we have gone so long, this 12 year lapse, that uh, normally like when you review a contract with your attorney, say if you're making changes between two parties, they'll call it a like red line and you might just have certain paragraphs. Well, we're, we're so far behind that a red line doesn't work because the, the changes that are going from 2012 to 2015 are total different sections, et cetera. It's been an unbelievable, arduous task. Uh, staff has reactivated our board. We've been kind of just not doing anything to take on the task of reviewing this new code. Uh, it's a heroic task because we have slipped 12 years or four, four code cycles. Don Whitmore, our, our chairman, is a local architect. Lisa Sharp, also a local architect. And our new member, which you, who you voted for this evening, Christine Scholl, bring unbelievable amounts of professional stature to our board. Christine Scholl has done uh, review work, just specifically review work on, uh, for a number of communities in East. Uh, retired general contractor Jim Ward, contractor Steve Irving, and myself, a general contractor, and also a building owner, bring many years of practical field experience to the table. Your staff, Ellen DeVita, Greg Hoyle from the fire department, Eric Hicks from the fire department, and Dan from SafeBuilt have greatly participated in these extensive meetings. I would leave this evening requesting three things from the council, one which you've already accomplished, voting affirmative for the three appointees. Consider this document closely when we bring this new doc document to you in the next few months. Um, it's very important when uh, architects come to our community and our new business that we're trying to bring to our community, they'll ask the code department, well, what code are you under? 2003. 2003? They have to kind of dust off their old code books off their shelves uh, to go back that far. Um, and in the, I would encourage you for th number three would be in the future, we should do code reviews on a three-year cycle, but absolutely on a six-year cycle so that this task can be accomplished much more easily. That's all. Okay. Any questions? Well, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Misty Hajishik. Thank you, Mayor Ray and Council. There's a handout, if I may have it passed out. Sure. I'll test your new. Thank you. You may. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here to speak to you as a citizen of DeKalb. And pardon me if, while I read you a statement, um, you have a copy of it now with some support supporting documents behind. Mayor Ray went to Moscow, Idaho to see a football game back on September 14, 2013. It was a Saturday. The cost of the trip was over $1,000 for the airline ticket, and there was also a hotel for a couple of nights, transportation, and meals. All of this was paid for by NIU. I dispute that, Misty. My hotel was paid personally. Okay. I, I, I accept that. Thank you for correcting me. The state ethics law limits gifts to $75 a day for meals, which is more generous than the city of DeKalb's municipal code. The, the code 803 gift ban states, A, the solicitation or acceptance of gifts prohibited to be solicited or accepted under the act by any officer or employee of the city of DeKalb is hereby prohibited. And B, the offering or making of gifts prohibited to be offered or made to an officer or employee of the City of DeKalb under the Act is hereby prohibited. Mayor Ray has been cited by City Manager Anne Marie Gara for an ethics violation during the recent election. It appears from these two things that Mayor Ray has trouble knowing what is ethical. Since the City of DeKalb did not pay for Mayor Ray to attend the football game in Moscow, Idaho on September 14, 2013, did Mayor Ray break the law? This leads me to wonder about a quid pro quo issue. What did President Douglas Baker expect from this gift? Could it be that President Douglas Baker expected help with University Village sale or even a positive vote from Mayor Ray in the future? Has there even been one time when Mayor Ray has voted against issues that NIU has wanted? And finally, 
Um, I have observed, in fact, I've been the victim of unprofessionalism by the city attorney, Dean Frieders, the city manager, Anne Marie Gara, and council member, ben, Bill Finucan. This behavior has happened when a concerned citizen, such as myself, has come before council to share their opinions. And you have called these citizens, including me, a liar, either in print or by insinuation. A person that comes before you is not a liar if they're sharing their opinions with you. That is called citizen comments. I certainly hope that this pattern does not repeat itself tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. Uh, Jim Mason. Good evening. Council, staff, everybody. We have a culture here in DeKalb. We have a culture of, um, this is Dodge City as far as I'm concerned. Over the months we've explained in spades what happens if you people do what you've done the other night. Misty uh, has exemplified some of the ways that the people in this community feel. Now, Mayor Ray, you've done what you've done and it can't be unwound. But Monica, O'Leary, and I did nothing. Nothing. She's not here. She's lost her home, she's lost her business, and she's off the council. This is what happens when too much government becomes too powerful. The petitioner Security Properties sent a letter that everybody's seen in the paper that somebody that doesn't agree with them should be investigated. This is what they do in Russia. This is what they did in Germany. I lost my appointment to the Board of Regents because of this. The reason I lost my appointment was because real quickly they got me under investigation <laughs> of which it was erroneous. Tim Struthers was just appointed. And he has more conflicts than maybe you do. We know all about the Bold Futures 220. I know all about college partners. I know everything. Now, I have a court case pending, and I haven't decided where I'm going with it. I'm right about 5-3 rule, and you know it. The law is very specific. You've got to have a majority of the elected officials, not the people that show up. So, let the games begin. I'm bringing in help on this issue. And to be very honest with you, John, I think you should resign tonight. You could have got me out of this. Dean over there knows better than that. When the petitioner calls up and says, uh, we've got somebody here that might try to bribe, why would I try to bribe somebody for the status quo? Do you people know what I mean by the status quo? If, if a security property has failed, we would maintain the laws that we have today, which means if we have a more than 50% blow or tornado, you have to rebuild it to the new standards. Well, that's what I was pushing for. But now that security properties may or may not win, I'm not sure yet, it would help me and my wife. Because I'll be in here looking for the same freebies. I'll be looking for the same zoning relaxation. And this will allow outside developers to come in here and ask for the same thing you gave uh, security properties for the rest of the buildings in this town. Now, Monica said before she left, I heard, that she wants more university villages. More. Okay? What's y'all saying? Too much of a good thing is too much. So, I got picked up on a technicality, knocked me out of the box. I'll be back. I come off. I'll come back. Because all I want to do, I'm a patriot. A friend of mine, I'm going to close this off. A friend of mine, why are you sticking your neck out like this, Jim? 
and spending so much money to do what's right for DeKalb? Because by the way, financing is available. I could finance Inc. tomorrow. You said last time, John, when I heard after I left, we need security deposit. Nobody else can finance this thing. That's a cakewalk. Anytime a piece of property is guaranteed 100% occupancy, can we get it financed? Well, of course we can. So um, I'm upset. This party isn't over. I didn't do anything wrong, but you did, sir. Thank you. I, I think we have a uh, problem that uh, needs to be addressed right now. Um, many years ago, eight, ten years ago, the state passed an ethics law, and the council and the mayor, under the direction of the city clerk, uh, Donna Johnson, uh, had to uh, study that law and pass a test in order to be able to serve. I don't recall any current councils or since then, unless the newly elected people can fill me in, did you have to take that test? and? And sign off on that when you, after you were elected, then then okay, then everybody should know better. Um, my concern here is that uh, uh, what's happening is something that that really, and you all received an, an email from from Dean Frieders. It was my objection to the uh, uh, Kate when the mayor was discussing with you in front of me to not postpone that vote because the city manager wouldn't be here tonight on the first vote. That was a, a violation of the Open Meetings Act. When I sent an email to Dean for, to clarify uh, what that discussion was about by preserving that email, that email was really a test to make sure that Dean basically slapped our hands and opened up the fact that we can't have a discussion, the three of us. So I, I question whether anyone really knows what there is right and wrong uh, up here. And the, the email that was sent to you was, should we hire an outside law firm or should Dean subcontract that firm under his contract? I say that we need to do it. Right before the last meeting, I didn't really understand uh, um, uh, what Monica was saying as far as who offered to fix her car uh, in order to make the first reading. Um, but I, uh, when I got clarification, it was a, an employee of NIU offered uh, to have her car fixed to make it to that first meeting because they said to her, and this was Monica's words, we need you here for the vote. We're counting on you. I believe that they knew that they needed the full council, as I insisted, should be here because every important vote like this, it needed six out of eight. I don't know that four out of the eight was enough to go forward. I think that will be tested in court. Um, but I encourage all of you to uh, uh, get back to Dean, and, and, and we need a special meeting. It can be on television, explaining the rules. If someone offers anything to you to get you to vote the way they want you to vote, you have to report it, period. If you accept anything, um, I don't know what you have to do at this point to fix your tax returns, but uh, I know some of us were pretty lucky the last time around. We didn't accept one penny. Um, it makes it real easy. You don't have to file if, if you didn't make the, if you didn't spend $3,000. But if you took the 3000 and you put it in a special account, it better still be there. Or you better have an accounting of where it went. If you spend over 3000 it has to go. If, if other people spend money that want to see you win and you didn't even have control over the ads in the paper, you have to add that up and you still have to do the reporting. You have days within which to do this, not years. If you put that money into your personal account and spend it, you better fix your tax returns. You know, if, if security properties can get away with throwing it up on the wall and saying we think some aldermen may have been offered or, or, or paid substantial sum, Dean's words to me, to vote no on an upcoming issue. And, and, and by the way, I, I, I don't agree with this email, Dean, that you sent out confirming uh, what was your discussion with Monica, she gave me a different discussion about the feeling that she got from you and Anne-Marie when you went down after 
she had had lunch and Emery had overheard her telling someone that she did not take money from Jim Mason. Her words to me were much different. I really think she resigned because of this confirmation that you sent to her. You're getting too political. You're, and, I, and I realize the stance that you made and a good attorney would do just what you did. But look at the result, she, she quit. It's getting out of hand, folks. And all of you better clean up your house, go talk to the state's attorney, what's happened to you, and uh, figure out how to fix it. Moving to uh, our consent agenda, um, we have before us uh, consent agenda. I would uh, remove F1 approval of city council minutes. We have the September 14th cow minutes before us. There is a correction to be noted in those minutes. Um, also removing F3, the resolution on funding DeKalb Chamber, and F4, the resolution of the tax increment financing agreement with stagecoach players would intend to be removed. With those uh, changes, are there any other uh, items to be removed by anyone on council? I thought you were they, moving the, the two items already. You mentioned before. We're moving, we are removing F1, F3, and F4, which leaves F2, the accounts payable. Okay, hearing nothing else, I'll ask um, for um, a motion to approve the consent agenda as modified. So moved. There's a motion by Alderman Snow, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Marquardt. Um, I'll ask for a roll call then. Baker? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Kanukin? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. And then I'd entertain a motion to approve uh, the item remaining on consent agenda. So moved. moved by Alderman Snow. Is there a second? Second. Alderman Marquardt seconded. A roll call. Jacobson? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Baker? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Moving to F1 then, approval of city council minutes. We have. Um, before us the Joint Council Meeting and Finance Advisory Committee of September 14, 2015, at which uh, Tom Gearhart is noted as present. Tom Gearhart was, in fact, absent at that meeting. So I'd like to have that correction noted in those minutes. And with that correction, is there a motion to approve the uh, COW meeting of September 14th as amended? So, so Moved by Alderman Marquardt, seconded by Alderman Noreko. Um, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Moving to F3, uh, Resolution 2015-112, authorizing a funding agreement with the Cal Chamber of Commerce in the amount not to exceed $45,000 for the purpose of facilitating community events during FY 2016. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Finucane. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Markward. Discussion. Um, Patty, do you wish at, to introduce this? Yes, at this time I'd like to um, have Community Development Director Ellen DeVita talk about this item. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Doesn't mm -hmm. sound right. Okay. Uh, Tonight you did hear the presentation from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, this, these presentations are typically given in June by several of our community partners. Uh, the city in the past has funded the Chamber of Commerce, the DeKalb County EDC, the DeKalb County Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, in a similar fashion using hotel motel revenues as, as the originating source to fund these types of partnerships uh, for economic development in the community. And uh, in the past, they were sitting in their own account in the Economic Development Fund, and Hotel Motel, as I said, was the revenue source um, that allowed for these funds. 
This year, the expenditure line item was rolled into the Community Development Department's funds, yet the source of the revenue is still derived from hotel motel receipts. Uh, the city has funded for two years annually uh, the chamber at 44,000, the EDC at 40, uh, did I say 45? I meant 45. Uh, the EDC at 45, the CVB at 50, and this year during the budget process, the City Council chose to fund operating funds at the Egyptian Theater at 25,000. That was the first time. Again, this is all coming out of the Community Development Fund um, and its partnerships for economic development in the community. The hotel motel revenues themselves, actually last year in fiscal year 15, we had 298,000. So we're more than covering the cost of these partnerships with uh, $298,000. So the Chamber's annual presentation was delayed this year because the city was approached by a group of merchants who wanted to better understand the agreement. And the city, uh, myself, Jennifer Diedrich, we went and met with um, the merchants who approached us and then with the Chamber several times. We also discussed this at several monthly merchant meetings which are hosted by the Chamber. And in those discussions, what arose was a discussion of the, what the Chamber was supposed to do. And so we clarified the role of the agreement that the city's had with the chamber these past two years. Some of the merchants felt that the funds were supposed to be used for supporting shopping-oriented events, the Girls' Night Out event and other things that you would typically see from a downtown Main Street group. Um, and if you read the agreement, it was for the chamber to fund community events the uh, community-wide festivals that don't necessarily have a shopping component, but are put in place to bring people downtown to create a sense of place and to draw the community together. So there's been two changes in the agreement that is before you tonight. It uh, expands the whereas, to greater explain that, and then the list of events has been modified. It has removed the shopping events, and it has greater detail on each of the action items the chamber will take in relationship to those events that they'll be putting on. I will note as a sidebar that the merchants have started working as a group to prevent event, to produce their events. Um, this is a postcard that was just printed. I had lunch with Lauren Wood today from Cracker Jacks and it's hometown holiday shop, sip and socialize November 6th from 5 to 10 p.m. And they're still looking to expand the number of merchants that wish to participate, possibly get this as a sheet that will be handed out at all the restaurants, for example, when you get your bill, just some takeaway materials. So um, in discussions with the chamber, the, the discussions included myself, Jennifer Diedrich, Chamber Board President Jill Tritt, and Director Matt Duffy. We agreed that we would move forward with this agreement found in your packet, and that over the next year, we'll review and identify changes that might occur for next year. And we would have rec any recommendations for changes during next year's budget presentation. I want to note the city uh, supports other community events, mostly in kind. Uh, for example, Corn Fest, all the in-kind contributions from the city are at about $60,000. The Artie Gras this year was $3,500. We put uh, $25,000 towards IHSA, the Illinois High School Sports uh, Championships here, and that's every other year. We also help with parades. So there's a variety of other events that we help produce. I don't know if you have any questions. Alderman <laughs> On the um, cover memo, there's an indication that um, in addition to the events that have already taken, that have typically taken place, mm -hmm. um, there's an event to be determined. Mm -hmm. Any idea what that might be or the focus of that or? Matt, this year we're doing Husky, um, isn't it one of the Husky events with NIU? <coughs> Matt, come, could come you on come up. to the <laughs> microphone, please? We don't have a set uh, event for that at this time, but we, in the past we did an Oktoberfest at the, at the airport, mm -hmm. uh, and we did the downtown uh, shopping events for this past year. That was the thing. So the whole idea is we're trying to do different things each year because ah, if you just okay. do the same things, then you don't you know, get a chance to venture out. So the mm -hmm. thought is, is we've got some ideas we're looking at probably springtime at this point uh, mm -hmm. with some new ideas of possibly we're partnering with NIU or partnered uh, with some other organizations mm -hmm. um, so that we branch out from just downtown, which was part of the confusion. If in the past some of those were just primarily downtown, Fourth Street, the airport, some of these other things allowed us to expand that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
if I may, some of the other things we've talked about is possibly a restaurant week mm -hmm. uh, or a taste of DeKalb. We've also been talking to Mike Embry about Kishfest and how mm -hmm. to bring that back in a different form next year. There's mm -hmm. a couple of ideas out okay. there. Thank you. Other questions, discussion? Okay, are you prepared for the question then? Um, I'll ask for a roll call. Finucane? Yes. Marcourt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Baker? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven yes. Okay, motion carried. Oh. Thank you. Resolution 2015-113. Authorizing a tax increment financing agreement with Stagecoach Players Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $217,452 for the purpose of financing a FY 2016 forgivable, forgivable loan for the property located at 126 South 5th Street. And let me turn to um, Acting City Manager. Patty. Mayor, that is also going to be addressed by Community Development Director Alan DeVito. Okay. Mayor, did you want a motion before the presentation? Yes, thank you, Dean. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Alderman Snow. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Noreko. Discussion. Okay, now that I have Director my folder. <laughs> Okay, this is an, uh, an item that's returning to you again at your request after your discussion on August 24th. So on August 24th, the council had considered a request from Stagecoach Players for assistance with some comprehensive improvements that were estimated at about 247000 They themselves proposed to invest 75000 and requested 172452 from the city's TIF fund based on the premise that this investment will improve their property and its EAV, as well as provide a ripple effect to the neighboring restaurants who would benefit from expanded activity at the Playhouse. Now, the original proposal did not include pa uh, paving of the lot and landscaping, and therefore the city staff has recommended an additional 25000 which brought the amount for consideration up to 272452 I'm just going to lose the 452 <laughs> as I talk. So Stagecoach would obtain three bids for all work to be completed. Uh, receipt of public bids is in our purchasing policy. And the landscaping and paving portion has not yet been bid. So there's interest in having this project completed this construction season. And there's some concern that the landscaping and paving could go potentially a bit higher. Therefore, there's a recommendation in here to allow for an additional 20000 need be in funding at the city manager's decision, which is under the authorized spending limit of the manager. So um, I had to really go through the numbers because there's quite a few. Originally, uh, Stagecoach had asked for 247. We suggested the 25,000 for paving and, and parking lot uh, paving and landscaping. And then if, if there's an additional 20, the project could conceivably go up to 217 total. So I'd like to note that this doesn't include any improvements to the right-of-way on 5th Street, and I, I think that's important. Um, the 2007 downtown plan notes a goal of extending the infrastructure that you find between 1st and 4th further through the downtown, so from 4th to 7th. And one of the things that we liked about this project and recommending it as a TIF project, the, and you'll remember the fiscal year 16 budget included up to $500,000 in TIF projects, so this is one we consider as part of that um, allowed for in the existing budget. Uh, this project in strengthens the core of the businesses on the east side of the t uh, tracks. And it, it follows right on the heels of the Fargo Skate Shop, which is a good thing. And so the reason I bring this up with the right of way is uh, the streetscape on 5th is pretty barren. It's a desert out there. <laughs> there's some bricks, there's almost no trees. Um, there is grass on the stagecoach side. And so we would like to, at a future date, bring back to you the proposal for a TIF project that would bring some nice streetscape on 5th Street. We are also talking with the owners of the Sawyer property right now, and they are about 70% close to bringing in some building plans 
for a mixed use project at the southwest corner of Fifth and Lincoln. So between the Fargo Theater and the Stagecoach and this new building north of Wendler on the former Sawyers, we'll have a nice investment, uh, area reinvestment downtown. So again, um, I just wanted to give a little side, side note on that. Okay. Are there any questions? Questions? Alderman yeah. Um Were you approached, was the city approached by any other uh, businesses, organizations in terms of um, use of the TIF funds? Not, well, we get requests for incentives all the time, and we always say, show us the gap. You know, why do you need the public funds? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's key. And, and there has to be a good overriding benefit to be on that business. And my own personal belief is it should be investment, too, that's really going to build the community in, in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I don't know if you're referring to anything specific. No, it, it's just that um, going to a level of 70 percent, you know, of the, the cost versus the guidelines of 20 percent. You know, I, I'm somewhat struggling with that. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, if there truly weren't any other, you know, reasonable projects, you know, certainly um, Stagecoach has enhanced um, the city activities and the vitality and, you know, the arts and so forth. But um, I, ju I just wanted to make sure that because there's such a strong presence mm -hmm. that other organizations didn't, you know, sort of step back and go, well, you know, it's hopeless or, you know, mm -hmm. that um, other worthwhile projects weren't ignored. I think there's plenty of worthwhile projects out there because down downtown DeKalb has so much to offer. You know, we're, we're talking in a lot of venues right now about just the whole cultural arts core that runs mm -hmm. through the city along the spine of Lincoln. I think there will be other projects coming down the road. Is there anyone in front of us right now on the table with a request? No. Mm -hmm. um, Sue Johnson is here. If, if you have any questions for the Stagecoach Board itself, um, I would turn the mic over to her if you have questions. Mm -hmm. But to directly answer your question, no, there's no other application that's been received by Jennifer for help right now. Ellen, but are there not um, funds earmarked? In the FY16 yes, TIF, there there for are downtown enhancement. Yes, uh, five hundred thousand. It was earmarked for physical improvements of buildings. I'm sorry, five hundred thousand. Okay, so yes. over half of those funds would remain to Correct. be funded okay. to appropriate projects. Correct, okay. and it's a policy discussion, you know, decision for the council on how they want to spend those. It's your decision. Sure. Okay. So. Okay. Alderman Snow. Um, recently I attended a conference and one of the uh, presenters was, was a, a person who used to work for a major retailer in, in uh, citing n new places for their company. And, and I think, you know, it was interesting some of his comments. Uh, when, a, when a company is looking to relocate, one of the first things they do is, is first look at your website. And that's why I think it was very important for us to upgrade our website. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're even going to visit this city, they're going to see well, what, what is your website? Uh, you know, uh, what, what kind of information can they glean from your website? He indicated the second thing he'd look, he'd, they'd look for when considering the community is they drive through the city. They drive through the downtown area. They see what condition the streets are in, what kind of landscaping you've got. You know, is the city kind of make, putting their best foot forward? And as part of that drive-through, one of the main things they look for is what are the entertainment venues? If they're going to bring in a company and they're going to relocate employees or hire employees, they want to know what their quality of life is at. So they look to see what, what kind of opportunities there are for, for uh, their residents that, that you know, their employees could also take advantage of. And I think that's why when I, when I looked whether to support a, a community project like this, I look at, will this enhance our community? Will this bring in new businesses? It, it's probably something that's hard to quantify, but, but it's there. He said, you know, th th that's what they do. They drive through the city. If they don't like what they see when they drive through the city, you may never know they were even here looking at your community. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you know, something like this is very important. It's, it's a, it's a nonprofit group, and we've had other nonprofit groups 
it's, it's an investment in the community. Um, the board of directors of nonprofits can never profit from this. If a nonprofit goes out of, out of business, the assets have to be given to another nonprofit. So, so, so it is truly a community asset. It's an investment in the community. So that's what I look for when I, when I, when I look to see whether to support this kind of a project. Other discussion? Ellen, did you say Sue had comments? I think she's here for questions, if you have any. I'm I don't here to answer any questions okay. anybody might It have doesn't appear the that there are. Okay. It doesn't appear that there are remaining questions on the project. Um, is there other discussion from council? If not, I'll turn to the roll call. Marcourt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Baker? Yes. Jacobson? No. Finucane? Yes. Ray? Yes. Six yes. Five yes. Six yes. <laughs> Six yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Moving to ordinance 2015-38, approving a special use permit for the co-location of Verizon Wireless Cellular Communications Equipment on the AT&T Tower at 1500 South 7th Street. And this ordinance is before us in second reading. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Alderman Finucane. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Marquardt. Um, I'll turn to acting city manager. Yes, at this time I'd like to um, introduce principal planner Derek Highland, who will d have discussion on this item. Good evening. You, uh, this is your second opportunity on this request. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Derek, has there been progress on um, any of the uh, caveats in the agreement? The, the specifications, I guess, is what I'm referring to. Um, landscaping, the color, and maybe we wouldn't expect to have had progress on any of those. Uh, at, at your last, uh, at the last meeting when this was considered under first reading, um, we have revised plans in the backup that shows the revised uh, landscaping plan. We show the color matching. Uh, so when you look at the listed summary of items on the actual ordinance, um, the petitioners have addressed three out of the five that I think are part of the backup. Uh, and the other two will be covered at the time of building permit. Okay. But for uh, record purpose and, and for memorializing what it is that, that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended, um, it was left in here just for consideration in case there's any question at some point in time down the road. Okay. But you're indicating there has been progress on three of the five. Uh, absolutely. Items. That was something they did immediately after the Planning and Zoning Thank Commission. You. Yep. Thank you. Other discussion? Alderman Baker. Derek, maybe your memory goes back, but help me out because it seems to be like a uh, meandering road with plan commission recommendations. Do they have to meet those recommendations or is the, re is the plan commission in this case or all cases purely advisory? In this particular case, since it is a special use permit, uh, they are a recommending body to the city council. The only time that the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation does not come before the city council is regarding a variance or a zoning board of appeal request. And so in this particular case, uh, the recommendation is, is submitted for the city council's consideration to be adopted into the ordinance. So this specific project, they are the recommending body to you and the rest of your councilmen. Other discussion, Alderman Snow? Um, you know, I, I think it's good that they're, they're using an existing tower to put this antenna mm -hmm. on, and I, and I think that's what the, the city is kind of focused on in their, their ordinances is to use existing structures when putting up new antennas, and, and I think that's primarily what we'll see new antennas is, is using exi existing structures, and that's what this is. So. Alderman Marquardt. Was this the same, boy, it seems like three, 
years ago, mm -hmm. but a couple months ago, they were there was a request for to build a totally new tower. Is this the same? It's the same applicant. It's a different same site. Applicants, but they're on the the adjacent property, correct? Okay. Other discussion. Seeing none, I'll ask for the roll call. Snow. Yes. Noriko. Yes. Baker. Yes. Jacobson. Yes. Finucan. Yes. Marquardt. Yes. Ray. Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carried. Moving to ordinance 2015-39, approving a map amendment, preliminary plan, and final plan, allowing Chipotle Mexican Grill located at 2383 Sycamore Road to have an outdoor patio. And this ordinance also is before us in second reading. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Noreco, a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Marquardt, discussion. Eric, do you wish to comment? Here to answer any questions. Uh, simply, um, this was part of a larger subdivision uh, in 2000, I believe is when it was initially approved and adopted. In that uh, subdivision application 15 years ago, outdoor patios were not contemplated as a particular use. Uh, Chipotle has the desire to have the outdoor patio, uh, hence why we came back with a map amendment and modification to the preliminary plan showing the outdoor patio. Okay. Discussion or questions of Derek? Seeing Alderman Marquardt. So is there a fence? There's not a fence at this time that they're proposing. Okay, so there's no fence because they're not contemplating alcohol That's right. sales out at that time. <laughs> okay. Alderman Baker. Refresh my memory, if you would. Um, are they only bound to the 15 foot from the door for no smoking, or is the whole patio no smoking? Or did this even come up? I'm going to turn to the city attorney. I, I believe under current city code, they'd be prohibited from smoking anywhere on the patio. Does that work on all the patios that are in town? That's my recollection of the current code, yes. Didn't, wasn't that code recently revised, Dean? Didn't we recently address that issue of smoking on patios? Yes. I thought so. Yes. It's 15 feet from the patio. Yes. Yeah. So they have to leave the patio with their alcoholic beverage to smoke? Sounds no, there's no alcohol on the patio. Outside the premises. Well, I, I was asking about the whole town since I it came up just now. Is that? Under the current city code, smoking would not be permitted on outdoor patios, whether at Chipotle or at other establishments. <coughs> I, I just haven't gone out to, uh, to the bars recently. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought there was a place for them other to be. questions or discussion? I'll ask for a roll call then. Noriko? Yes. Baker? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven yes. Okay, motion carried. Um, moving to reports and communications then. Um, Alderman Jacobson. It's, it's nice and early, so um, <laughs> I have foregone the opportunity to provide comments the last few meetings and would ask that due to the early hour, you indulge me while I share a few comments about the experience I had while representing the city at the last weekend's Illinois Municipal League Conference in the city of Chicago. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't first mention the very pleasant time I had better getting to know both Alderman Noriko and Snow and City Clerk Johnson. The downtime allowed during both meals and after hours allowed for an excellent opportunity for us to better understand one another and where we come from. It allowed for free-flowing conversation about the sessions we had participated in, the sharing and exchange of information and ideas from those sessions, along with adequate one-on-one -on -one time to discuss several of the issues that we often face in our time and how they in our town and how they relate to us. This is one of the major benefits I see in the conference. 
One that I think as a whole we as a city often miss out on is many council members are either unable to attend or have chosen in past years to spend the downtime not with the group. While we are expected to act as one cohesive unit in decision making, it surprised me how very little I actually knew about the people and their ideas that I spend eight to ten hours in this small room with a month. <laughs> I would encourage that all members of the council going forward commit to using the IML conference or to create another better avenue to better our opportunity to share our own ideas and vision with one another in order to seize the driver's seat, so to speak, of bettering our community and not just discussing what's been put forth on the agenda in front of us. I use that to segue into my next comments. The conference was an ability to get out and see what else is going on outside the city limits of DeKalb. While oftentimes we focus on what's in front of us, it's nice to have that opportunity sometimes to go out and open your eyes to what's going on in the world outside of, of what's right down the street. It was encouraging to see that there are some signs of improvement across the state, both in large municipalities and even the smallest where the city government takes the lead in innovating, using technology, and focusing on thinking outside of the box in terms of loosening business strangling regulation, updating zoning and municipal codes to be relevant in the current times we face, and both courting new industry while supporting existing business in their towns. Adequate util utilization of new technology, reduction in costs through action, and not just talking about action, and most importantly, allowing the tax base to expand quickly, easily, and with multiple supports of the city, not hurdles from the city, were hallmarks of what these thriving towns seem to share universally. Many municipalities face aging, underutilized downtowns and have creatively found ways to transform them, oftentimes with very limited funds and without the many benefits we have here in our own community. I have heard, I heard several mayors, including the mayor from Marion, Illinois, celebrating his 56th year in office, which was <laughs> quite impressive, um, discussed by their peers as visionaries. They were quick in their comments to share this description of their council members. They stressed the important, importance and impact, most especially of the elected officials' roles in leading these efforts often mentioning the copious amounts of time and effort these officials need to commit to the success of these projects, leaving staff and consultants to execute the council and residents' vision and not vice versa for these projects to succeed. Additional themes of focus were to avoid being led down the path of reactive decision making and to openly foster the change and growth necessarily post-recession to make a city viable and vibrant, not just to expect it, to hope it, it comes. These municipalities also shared an important bis, bit of wisdom that I found quite interesting. Oftentimes it's easy to take the opinions of the same old faces, both in the community and in City Hall, when getting input for projects. But it's only through seeing the projects through the eyes of the most vocal naysayers and even through fresh sets of eyes of what out-of-towners think about your community, can projects have a chance to be successful. While many of these issues seem simple, I think it was eye-opening for me to see what breeds success and how different it is from the way I perceive the way we often do business in DeKalb. And seeing the hurdles many of these municipalities face and eventually overcame to turn their towns around <laughs> It is without a doubt that we have all of the ingredients for success in our city. We have so many benefits that these communities didn't have the ability to build their cities around. What we lack is the drive, the effort, and most importantly, the vision by the people that sit on this dais to make the changes we so desperately need. Other municipalities are turning the quarter, corner while we remain stagnant. That's not by accident. That's my choice. The choices we who sit up here have made, and more importantly, have the opportunity to make. Let's stop the talk, the sound bites, the political correctness, and the cheerleading, 
and either get hard to work in making the change our constituents deserve or get out of the way so someone else can do it for us. Thank you, Dave. Alderman Finucan? No report. Alderman Marquardt? Uh, no report. Alderman Snow? Um, I also attended the, the conference, as Alderman Jacobson said, and, and so I echo a lot of what he said. It was an opportunity to, to meet uh, other aldermen, other mayors, other city officials. Uh, the Illinois Municipal, Municipal League has been in existence since 1914, so this is their 102nd annual conference. And it's really a quite an opportunity. You have dozens of sessions you can go to. Uh, you can sort of pick your topics and, and uh, listen to a presentation, network with other aldermen, uh, talk about common problems, common solutions. Um, also, there were some, some group sessions. We had an opportunity to to listen to Joseph Kennedy, the uh, I think he was the eighth son of Robert Kennedy, although I didn't agree with everything he said. It was kind of mm -hmm. interesting to, to hear his, his uh, comments. Uh, Evelyn Sanguinetti, the lieutenant governor, um, also uh, Alderman Norico and myself I had an opportunity to, to meet Governor Rauner as he walked into the reception. We had a, a, a couple minutes where we had a private conversation with the governor, so that was kind of a unique opportunity to, to, to uh, talk about a little bit about maybe DeKalb. Um, so, so it was very interesting, and, and I do think we are moving forward as a community. Perhaps uh, I won't say we're stagnant. I, I do think we're, we're improving. I, I think everything we do up here that is a step in the right direction. I, I think DeKalb is on the right track. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Noreko. Well, as you've heard, I also attended the conference and um, was kind of the new kid on the block. Um, I made sure that I attended some technical sessions, um, use of social media, uh, information about the demolition process, building codes. I had no idea. Um, it kind of scares me when I hear about all the codes that have to be met and when and how and so forth. But. Um, and of course, the networking opportunities that have been addressed. Um, Alderman Jacobson somewhat stole my thunder, uh, as he, he um, is prone to do, by uh, his comment about appreciating getting to know um, the opportunities we had to get to know each other. And, you know, I, I certainly echo that. Um, you learn some fun and interesting facts, not all of which will be revealed here. Um, and I do appreciate um, that the city gave us this opportunity. Um, I'm going to conclude with um, uh, an exhortation that we heard earlier this week from a famous visitor to the United States, Pope Francis, in urging um, U.S. lawmakers to work together for the common good. And I think we can all remember that even, you know, at this level. I think um, that is part of what is needed for DeKalb to uh, move forward and move to the next level. Thank you. Alderman Baker. I'm, I'm sitting here uh, in shock uh, over the news of uh, Monica's uh, contemplation of resignation. I'm thinking of uh, the seventh ward alder people that uh, have come before. One uh, is now a judge. Uh, uh, actually, I think he was an appointed judge and is a very successful attorney. Uh, another one's uh, one of our Illinois state uh, representatives. Uh, to the 69th district. Uh, another one went on to be a uh, city manager. Uh, Monica, you're a great mother. You have uh, uh, a great um, family. I urge you not to resign. Uh, you're in a battle to get back into your house. You are still in standing to be on the council. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You are still the seventh ward alder person. You do not have to resign. Don't, let, don't be intimidated by anyone, especially a city manager and city attorney. I believed you when you said that you pleaded with both the city manager and the city attorney when they 
did nothing less than ambush you at your place of business. That, you're, that you not only did not accept a bribe, nor were you ever offered a bribe in exchange for a no vote on the University Village security properties issue. I believe you were intimidated. You were clearly a no vote. And there was a concerted effort to go after you. Stand up, Monica. Stand up for your rights. Do not be intimidated, please. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a comment from uh, Sycamore's uh, chief of police that was offered to me recently um, regarding the effectiveness of the multi-jurisdictional response to the recent armed robbery on Sycamore Road. Um, Greg attributed that he has experience or in his experience are multi-jurisdictional responses in other communities. He said he's never seen one work as smoothly as the recent one here that included the Cal Police Department, NIU PD, um, the County Sheriff's Department, and uh, Sycamore PD. I think it's a strong testament from the profession um, that uh, reflects positively on that multi-jurisdictional response. So Chief Lowry, thank you, you for your part and leadership in leading DeKalb PD in that uh, network. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Um, acting city manager? No report. City attorney? Mayor, I guess uh, what I would say this evening is that it places me at a considerable disadvantage when there's a unilateral disclosure of information that relates to a privileged topic. Um, and nonetheless, I endeavor to uphold the highest standards and not respond uh, whether the disclosure is accurate or not unless directed to do so by the council. And that will continue to be the approach that I take uh, following the direction of a majority of the council. Thank you. Thank you. City Clerk? Um, I just wanted to, again, echo the sentiments of um, the alderman who spoke on the IML conference and thank the city for allowing me to participate. I learned a lot and it was very valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Chief Lowry. No report. Chief Hicks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This Sunday, October 4th at uh, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., the fire department will be hosting the annual open house and pancake breakfast. Uh, all are welcome to attend. Thank you. Uh, Director Haley. I just want to say the audit team from Lauterbach and Eamon are in house this week and will return again the week of October 12th to do the final field work on the fiscal year 2015 audit. So. Thank you. Director DeVita. I'd like to give you an update on the RFP for building services, the third party vendor that we have working on the building. When we first uh, came and revised the safe build contract, we had indicated it would be here within 30 days. I think I've rewritten the thing three or four times now, and Dean's rewritten it once. Um, and there's good reason for that, uh, because the more entrenched I get in the building department, the more I'm looking at how we operate. And as you already heard from Chuck Shepard, we've been looking at the building codes. I've been spending a lot of time downstairs in the building area looking at process and flow because it's the foundation of our building, our business climate. And so what's been going on right now, we just finished mapping, I'll call it, each of the processes. So we've got four different process flows based on who reviews the, the type of permit. So we've got over the counter where just the building department is looking at something. We've got over the counter small permits, minor permits where building and engineering are looking. We've got remodel and additions, and then we've got new construction. And for each permit type, we've identified from beginning to end who's responsible at each of six stages. So when the permit is taken in, the intake, the review of the submission to ensure it's complete, because if it's not complete, we spend a lot of time going back and forth asking for more information. And then we have to coordinate the comments and responses from all the internal departments and the external agencies. Then we move into the inspection phase after the permit's issued. Then we get into the final closeout of uh, checklists and the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. And then the file closeout is a whole other phase, making sure we've archived things, uh, we've closed out all the finances, et cetera, gotten everything that we need in-house. And we've started to ask for electronic versions of all 
final as-builts and submittals so that we have less time scanning some of the stuff that's going on. Um, at the same time, I look at what's going on. We're almost at 2006 levels of activity for permits. Uh, the department itself at one point had 23 people. In 2006, we were down to 18. Right now, we've got six uh, full-time and two part-time, the two vendors. So we're, we're, we're moving along. I'm not complaining. I just want to let you know that's where we're at. So the reason we took the pause in releasing the RFP was in, a, in order to use and, and manage this with who we have in-house, we're going to have to take some of it and push it over towards the vendor. So that's why we mapped everything out. So it, at the end of each of those six phases, is there anything that we're doing in-house that possibly the vendor could be doing for us? And that's why we took the pause. Um, so Dean and I will be wrapping up the RFP and bringing it to you shortly. Just wanted to give you an update on that, okay? Thank you. Department manager, favor. I just want to give an update on South First Street water main replacement. Um, as you know, that's been a multi-year multi uh, replacement program, and we're hoping to have that wrapped up by the end of next week. And I wanted to thank the public for their patience. Uh, I know there's been a lot of detours and, and different traffic, traffic configurations, and so I wanted to thank everyone for their patience. But that project should be wrapped up hopefully by next week. Thank you. And Brian, I'd like to thank you for working um, smoothly into that north extension from Lincoln Highway to the railroad. I understand that was deferred initially, but uh, it's coming to completion. And uh, I know for a fact that's not without its challenges. Uh, um, Elliot and Wood had left the site uh, thinking they had everything secure. Um, I saw water flowing. I saw you on a cell phone <laughs> a couple Saturdays ago <laughs> remedying that uh, situation. So thank you for the effort and thank, thank the department. Um, at this point, I'd entertain a motion to hold an executive session uh, for discussion of personnel as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2C1 and approval to hold an executive session to discuss collective bargaining as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2 C2. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Jacobson. Is there a second? Second. Se seconded by Alderman Marquardt. Uh, roll call. Baker? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Fnukin? Yes. Marquardt? Yes. Snow? Yes. Noriko? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. Motion carried. We'll utilize the large uh, conference room. <laughs>